Go inside and go ahead to peace. Thanks, Ahmed. We'll give a few minutes to people to join. Okay. So hi everyone, welcome to uh, welcome again to one of our webinars. Uh, uh, um, the webinar today under the title of Conflict of Interest for Expert Witnesses in International Arbitration. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the, uh, the panel today. Uh, our speaker is Julian Paley, is a partner from White and Case uh, in London, United Kingdom. Uh, we have a special guest, Ahmed Lansari, uh, Technical Office Manager in, uh, of Public Work Authority of Qatar Ajgal, um, and he also the Chartered Sufi Arbitrator uh, Branch President. And myself, Saad Hagazi, I will be uh, moderating the uh, webinar today. So uh, before we start, let me give you a brief about uh, CIR, Chartered Sufi Arbitrators in uh, Qatar. Uh, Charter of Arbitrators in Qatar uh, officially opened in 2018. Total number of board members currently are 14 members, and we have active members of 322 uh, in partnership and agreement with uh, Qatar International Court and Dispute Resolution Center. The CIR uh, Qatar branch committee, as you can see on the right side, uh, is from the President Ahmed Lansari, Matthew Walker, the Honorary Secretary, Abdurrahman is the Vice President, Tamam is the Treasury, we have Katrina, the Governance, uh, shown for education, and another shown for education, myself for the public relation, Norul for uh, the events and social, and we have Adib for the young members, Pamela, uh, and Stephen, and Avinash, and uh, Muhammad are the newly uh, appointed uh, members. Uh, so uh, to start today, we'll start with the agenda. Uh, we will uh, give you a brief about the uh, speaker. Then we will start later uh, with his presentation. Um, then we will have a closing uh, rewards from Ahmed. Uh, then we will start the uh, question and answer. Please use the Q&A uh, box um, uh, um, you can see on the webinar to ask any questions. Don't use the chat because this will allow us to concentrate more and answer the questions in, in um, in a um, uh, proper way. Um, so before we start, Julian. Uh, Julian is a, a partner in White and Case London, where he practices international arbitration with a focus uh, upon construction and engineering projects and disputes. He's also the author of Construction Law, uh, third edition, 2020, and he's visiting fellow of the uh, Dickinson Poon uh, School uh, of Law, uh, King's College in London. He uh, adjunct professor at law at Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha. Uh, so please welcome Julian. He's one of the reputable authors and uh, practitioners in the world. And we are lucky that we have him today speaking about very important uh, topic of, uh, of expert witnesses. Uh, so uh, Julian, would you uh, like to join me? 
Thanks very much, Saad. I, I certainly would like to join you. Um, I'll now attempt to uh, share yeah. my screen. Perfect. Floor is yours. See how this goes. Uh, I want to go with slideshow from the beginning. Oops. Let's start then at the, um, the beginning, which is a little overview of the, the topic. Um, and, and what we're going to look at. And so we're going on a bit of a journey today. Uh, we're not going straight into conflicts of interest, but we're going to look at how um, expert evidence has evolved, certainly from an English law um, perspective. And then we're going to get into how uh, things are looking in relation to expert evidence uh, and, and the conflicts of interest um, position that now seems to exist or is at least emerging. And to conclude, as, as mentioned, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So I hope that's all okay with everyone. So let's, let's um, get into it. And we can get into the, the evolution, if you like, of, of English law. So English law is not something that is set out in a code. Qatar, of course, has uh, its, its civil code and its commercial code. English law is a bit different. Uh, you have English common law, which has evolved bit by bit over time, largely through the decisions of courts, that is, of, of judges. Um, and so to, to examine the position in relation to experts, I thought we would start at what is probably the most important um, case for experts, at least uh, it, it's a seminal case concerning expert evidence in English law. And, and so you can see here on the slide uh, two photos, um, which you, you probably recognize uh, as being not from uh, Qatar, so that's not Doha, it's not Lucille or anywhere like that. Um, it's actually in England. It's on the uh, the north coast of East Anglia. And um, this is actually a place that's quite familiar to me because my, my wife's family lives not too far from here. Uh, and the, the village you see here is called Wells, or its full name is Wells Next to Sea because it's next to the sea. So it's quite a pretty place and I spent a bit of time there. Um, but things haven't always been pretty in Wells, uh, and I'll, I'll explain why. So if you look at the, the, the right-hand side, you can see it looks a bit estuarine, and, and, and that is very much the case. You have lots of rivers uh, along the coast which flow into these harbours and then eventually into the sea. And, and that's just naturally how things have evolved there. So what is this case about folks and Chad? Well, uh, you had a landowner called Folks, and, and he owned some land at this harbour. Um, but what, one of the features of this part of the, the Norfolk coast is that you get flooding from time to time. So, so what Mr Folks did was he, he built on his land, which was next to, to the, the harbour, he built an embankment. And, and, and the reason he built the embankment was to try to stop the water flooding his, his farming land. Um, which it would from time to time. So he built this embankment. Um, anyway, what, what happened was over a number of years, the harbour began to silt up. So, so lots of particles were built up and, and clogged up the, um, the harbour. And the, the people who ran the harbour, the, the, the harbour board, were a bit upset about this. And they were looking for an explanation for why this happened. And they, they pointed the finger of blame at Mr. Folks, and they said, well, you built this embankment. This embankment is stopping the water from flowing out into the sea. It's causing all this siltation and destroying our harbour. Uh, so so you, you need to destroy the, the embankment yourself. Uh, if not, we will do it. And in fact, they, they then started themselves, the harbour commissioners, to destroy the embankment on, on Mr. Folks's land. And, and Mr. Folks, who happened to be a lawyer as well, wasn't particularly happy about this. So he um, applied to the court for an injunction to stop the harbour commissioners from tearing down his embankment. So the case went to court. And what happened in, in, in the court case? Well, the issue there was why was the harbour silting up? Why, why, why was it decaying? And what folks said was, well, actually, my embankment that I've built has nothing to do with the harbour silting up. It's all to do with the rivers, that the rivers in the area constantly dump particles into the harbour and that, that's the problem, not my embankment. Whereas the harbour commissioners were adamant that their harbour was being destroyed because of 
this embankment. So, so how, how, how does one get to the bottom of all this? Well, what Mr. Folks did was he called a, a person who we would think of as, as an expert witness. And, and this man uh, was an engineer, he's a real specialist in marine engineering. In fact, um, he's referred to these days as the father of civil engineering. His name is John Smeaton. And, and you can see him there in the portrait. And so he was the total expert on um, marine engineering. And so anyway, Mr. Smeaton's view of this was that actually um, his client, uh, Mr. Folks, the landowner, was right. Um, the the harbour was, was not decaying because of the embankment that was there. It was decaying because of all this siltation. And what Smeaton said was he'd been all along the coast and he'd seen similar kinds of siltation in harbours where there weren't any embankments. So he, he concluded from that that actually the embankment was not the cause of the problem. So that, that's how this evidence was framed. But the issue before the court, and why, why this case is, is, is significant, or one of the reasons, is that um, the defendants, the Harbour Commissioners, said this evidence should not be before the court. Why, why did they say that? Well, they said because the only evidence that can go before the court, and this, in, in this case before a jury, was evidence from people who were involved. So the, the only people who could get, give evidence were, were fact witnesses who could say what happened and when and why. Um, but of course, no fact witness could really talk about this because it came down to an expert um, view. Now, Mr. Smeaton hadn't been involved in this particular project, so he couldn't say what had happened and when and why. All he could do was express his uh, expert opinion. So there was an issue about whether this evidence was admissible in, in, in the court at all. These days, you wouldn't hesitate in saying, well, of course, it should be. But, but back then, this was not clear at all in English law. So what did the court conclude? Well, here, here's the, the, here are the words from the, um, the judge who gave the leading judgment. And this is Lord, Lord Mansfield, who was um, actually the most significant judge of his day. And even now, we, we probably regard him as the most significant commercial law judge in English law history. And he made the position very clear because he said, he said that the, the evidence was admissible. And he said, the cause of the decay of the harbor is a matter of science. Um, it didn't say a matter of expert evidence. He said a matter of science. And he said of this, such men as Mr. Smeaton, the engineer alone can judge. Therefore, we're of opinion that his judgment formed on facts was very proper evidence. So you, th this case is, is, is important because it establishes um, clearly under English law that in certain cases where you need a, a man or woman of science to, to assist the court, that you can have evidence from um, such a person. So that, that's, a, that's a starting point for expert evidence in English law, and a very important one. Um, th th there's one other point that I, I will draw to your attention, though, which, which I think is relevant here, is that if we go back to... Mr. Smeaton, um, let, let's look at who he was. Well, he was a busy engineer going out designing lighthouses and embankments and things like that. Engineering was his day job. He was called from his day job to, to give evidence in court. And, and we don't know whether he was paid for that. Maybe he was, um, but in any case, that was not um, his, his true business. Um, he was there to help the court. If we then go forward in time, we're going, we're leaping through centuries now, and we're going forward to the 20th century. So let, let's, let's position ourselves in, say, the 1960s um, in, in, um, in the Northern um, Hemisphere, at least. Uh, we, we see a vast change in the landscape in relation to expert evidence. So experts' evidence can be admitted into to courtrooms, that's all fine. But we, we see the emergence of a new breed of expert witness. Um, so Smeaton was a part-timer and not even a, someone who made his, his livelihood from, from going to court. But by the 1960s, there, there was a group of people who were, were full-time or more or less full-time expert witnesses. And, and um, the, the, there were some problems which emerged in relation to these experts, particularly in the United States, where you had, um, and still have, of course, medical negligence cases where uh, a doctor might have done something wrong and, and uh, an expert um, medical person was called to, to give evidence either way. And so the, the, the position which emerged certainly in, in the States was one whereby if you wanted to, to argue a particular case, 
um, whether for a doctor or against a doctor, you could find someone to support um, what you wanted to say. So, so in, in other words, you could find these hired guns, experts for hire, who'd go around saying whatever they thought would support their client's um, case. And, and this was not a, um, a happy position, of course, for, for the courts, because it meant that the court was not receiving particularly good evidence. It was, it was biased evidence that was coming um, before the court. So that was the situation in the, in the US. And th there was some uh, threat of this coming over to, to England as, as, as well, certainly in relation to professional expert witnesses. But th there was then um, a, um, a, a, a backlash against that, which came from, from the English courts, from the highest court, actually. Uh, and and this, this came from a few cases, but I, I want to focus on one, which is the case of White House and Jordan from 1981 where in one of the leading judgments, Lord Wilberforce, who you see there, um, a, a descendant of, of the, um, the, the, um, the, the great man who um, helped to free the world from slavery, um, he, he expressed this view. He said, while some degree of consultation between experts and legal advisors is entirely proper, it's necessary that expert evidence presented to the court should be, and should be seen to be, the independent product of the expert uninfluenced as to form or content by the exigencies of litigation. To the, to the extent that it is not, the evidence is likely uh, to be not only incorrect, but self-defeating. So you can see here there's a very clear message that's being sent out that expert evidence needs to be independent. And, and that if, if lawyers lean on an expert to, to, to um, say a particular thing, which goes against the expert's opinion, or if the expert is, is quite happy to volunteer any opinion, to, to help the case. Well, that's not going to be very helpful at all to the court because it, it's biased, it's incorrect, and it's self-defeating, as Lord Wilberforce made quite clear here. So, so let, let's then move on in, in our little um, evolutionary story for, from White House and Jordan to 1998. And this was a significant year in English um, litigation. Why? Because it involved the creation of a new set of uh, court rules, and these are called the um, uh, Civil Procedure Rules, or the CPR uh, for short, and, and they provide for all sorts of things to do with litigation in English courts, including in relation to expert evidence. And, and, and we'll have a little look at what um, the CPR says about expert evidence. Um, and the relevant provision is, is um, uh, Rule 35.3. And if you look at number one there, um, this is the primary duty of, of experts. This is it is the duty of experts to help the court on matters within their expertise. That, that's quite an interesting sentence, I think, because if we go back to, to what we were looking at a moment ago, the problem was one of uh, independence or lack of independence of, of, of experts. And this is not saying experts need to be independent. It actually goes further than that. It says experts have a duty, a positive duty, to help the court on matters within the experts' um, expertise. And then rule two, uh, sub rule two says this overrides any obligation to the person uh, from whom experts have received instructions or whom, whom they're paid. But that's that. And then we, we, we have uh, sitting beneath that, uh, what is called a, a practice direction, which accompanies each, each rule in, in the civil procedure rules. And there's one in relation to expert evidence and, and the, the general requirements, as you'll see here from the practice direction are in 2.1, expert evidence should be the independent product of the expert uninfluenced by the pressures of um, litigation. And, and, and if you get, we go back a slide, you can say, well, that's almost word for word what Lord Wilberforce said here about it being the independent product of the expert uninfluenced as to form or content by the exigencies of litigation. So that, that's, that's now reflected in, in, in the practice direction regarding expert evidence. And, and then in 2.2, um, says experts should assist the court by providing objective, unbiased opinions on matters within their expertise and shouldn't assume the role of, of an advocate. So that's, that, that's what the English uh, rules of court say in relation to experts, that those are the primary requirements for experts. Now, one thing you might be thinking already is, OK, that's, that's very interesting, but um, what about conflicts of interest? If we go back to this to the rules you don't see any mention at all of conflicts of interest you see this there's a duty to help the court there's this duty to give independent 
uh, evidence, uh, but nothing about conflicts of interest. So, so that's that's a bit um, uh, odd, perhaps. Uh, maybe, maybe not. In any case, think things move on even further from 1998, um, and when we have a case which uh, I think is quite important. It's called Toth and Jarman, which comes in from 2006. And this wasn't a construction case it, or, or indeed an arbitration. So it, it's a case about um, a doctor, a GP, a pediatric GP, um, again, who, who was sued for, for negligence. And in the court case, um, the GP was defended by um, the Medical Defence Union, which is an insurer for, for doctors. Um, that's, that's all fairly normal. Now, what, what is where things get interesting was that the, the expert for the GP um, was a person who was a, who was a doctor, um, but he'd also been a member up until just before this, this, this case, he'd been a member of the cases committee or of the, the, the MDU, the insurer. Um, so so, so the, the, the insurer's um, role really is to defend the, 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 the doctor against whom the claim is made and to minimize um, the cost to, to, to the insurer of, of the particular claim. So, so the, 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 the idea that a person from the cases committee of the MDU could give evidence for, for the, the GP in this case um, seemed a bit problematic because um, such a person would have a conflict of interest. Now the situation was, was saved here because the relevant expert had actually just resigned from the cases committee of, of the, the MDU before um, this case came along. Um, so, so, so the court let in um, the evidence. But what the court did in this case was give a discussion about conflicts of interest in relation to, to expert evidence. And of course, we, we, we know that the, the rules of court don't mention conflicts of interest. So, so what did the court here have to say about conflicts? Well, the Court of Appeal, which is the, the, the second highest court in, in England, um, said, does the presence of a conflict of interest automatically disqualify an expert? Uh, in, in our judgment, the answer to that question is no. The key question is whether the expert's opinion is independent. That seems OK, because that, that's what the rules of court um, suggest, that you have to have independent expert evidence. Um, and the court then said it is now well established that the expert's expression of opinion must be independent of the parties and the pressures of the litigation. And that's what Lord Wilberforce said in, in White House and Jordan. That's all fine. But then things um, are expressed slightly differently in, in later paragraphs in, in, in this case, because here, as you can see in paragraph 102, the court says, while the expression of an independent opinion is a necessary quality of expert evidence, it does not always follow that it is a sufficient condition in itself. Where an expert has a material or significant conflict of interest, the court is likely to decline to act on his evidence or indeed to give permission for his evidence to be adduced. This means it is important that a party who wishes to call an expert with a potential conflict of interest should disclose details of the conflict as early at, at an early stage of the proceedings as possible. Now, I've highlighted the, the, the sentence there in the middle because that's referring to, to conflicts of interest and what can happen if there is a conflict of interest. So, so the court saying if there's a material or significant conflict, the court is likely to decline to act on the evidence or to give permission for the evidence to be adduced. So that, that's, that's suggesting actually if an expert witness has a conflict of interest, the court may not allow the evidence in at all. So that 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 is very problematic, potentially, for an expert who does have a conflict. And then we go on to some further statements that the court made. And the court said, again, that there is another side to independence. So it's elaborating upon independence, enlarging upon it. The expert should not leave undisclosed any conflict of interest which might bring into question the suitability of its evidence as the basis for the court's decision. A conflict of interest could be of any kind, including a financial interest, a personal connection, or an obligation, for example, as a member or officer of some other body. But ultimately, the question of what, uh, what conflicts of interest fall within this description is a question for the court, taking into account all the circumstances of, of, of the case. So that paragraph is, is suggesting that 
conflicts of interest are a big issue for ex experts. They need to be um, disclosed. But uh, the, 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 the paragraph is not particularly helpful, at least it's highly vague, I suggest, because it's not saying um, when a conflict of interest exists. The court is saying, well, it all depends on the circumstances of the case. That's not particularly clear guidance for anyone. So that was Toth and Jarman, and that, that's um, my take on things, took things in a, in a different direction for, for English law. Um, and, and so what we, we, we see with Toth, Toth and Jarman is in fact what I've called mission creep. So, so if we look at where, where, where we started, which is the requirement that experts give independent evidence, um, what, what does that mean? Well, that means that the quality of the evidence must be independent, must be impartial. So, so it means if, if the expert is before the court, the expert is calling it as he or she sees it, giving an, a, an honest view to, to, to the court, to the judge. That, that's not dealing at all with the conflicts of, of, of interest. And what um, Toth and Jarman does is it adds a gloss to, to this requirement of independence. And it says not only must an expert give evidence which is independent, the expert himself or herself must be independent in the sense of not having a conflict of interest. And, 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 to, and to my mind, this actually um, is an additional step, which probably goes too far in a way, um, because the, the requirement of um, English law is, is that of independent evidence, not that there be no conflicts of, of, of interest. And so now I'll, I'll turn briefly to, to something which could have been covered, I suppose, at the start, but it now seems like a good time to do it, which is for us to, to look at, well, what is a conflict of interest? What, what are we even talking about here? Um, and it, it's actually reasonably difficult to do in a, in a general sense. Conflicts of interest are, are uh, situation and profession specific. So I, I, I'm a solicitor and, and I'm subject to certain rules which are set by the, um, the regulator, the SRA. And unfortunately for solicitors, conflicts uh, of interest are relatively well defined. And, and so here's, here's what the rules say for solicitors in England. It says, it means a situation where your separate duties to act in the best interest of two or more clients in relation to the same or related matters conflict. So, so an example of this might be, um, as you'll see here, uh, where you're acting for, um, two parties that are involved um, against each other in litigation. So if you've got Punch suing Judy uh, and Judy counterclaiming against Punch, what you can't do is be the lawyer for both Punch and the lawyer for, for Judy. You, you have to pick sides um, because th there's a clear conflict of, of interest between those particular parties. So that, that, that's fairly clear in, in my world, the, the world of solicitors. But what about for expert witnesses? What, what, what are the applicable rules here for, for expert witnesses. Um, well, a, as I've indicated already, um, there's been very little guidance given from the courts about this. And there's actually furthermore a problem or what I think is, is potentially a contradiction because in addition to um, what we've seen, there's another aspect to, to what English common law has, has said about conflicts of interest. And this, is, this applies in relation to employees of a party. And there have been a few cases, uh, including this one I refer to here, Field and Leeds Council, where the courts have said there's no overriding objection to a properly qualified person giving opinion evidence because he's employed by one of the parties. The fact of his employment may affect its weight, but that is another matter. And that, that was the judgment of um, Sir Anthony May, who you see there on, on, on the slide, a very distinguished um, construction law judge. Um, so. so how does this work then? If if employee of a party, someone who's on the payroll of a party, uh, can give ev give expert evidence for for that party, don't don't we have a, a conflict of interest there? Um, well, I think maybe you do, but but this is saying that that does not prevent the evidence from being um, admitted. So 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 where are we? Uh, I mean, having gone on this this this, this strange journey. Um, so now, what, what, where does English law currently sit? Well, I, I, I'll try to summarise it um, this way. We, we, we can say that uh, when giving um, expert evidence, it's not enough 
for, for the expert to, to be independent in, in the way that he or she gives evidence. Yes, they have to be independent in, in the sense of calling it as they see it, but um, that's, that's not really enough, it seems, under English law, because experts must also be independent, have to be independent of, of, of the parties when, when they're, giving, they're giving their evidence. And that means avoiding um, conflicts of interest. So that, that seems to be the way that English law is developing or has developed in relation to um, expert evidence. So, so what, what does this, this mean? Well, it, it, it means in this particular paradigm that there are, there are now potentials for, for expert witnesses to find themselves in, in difficulty where they do have what, what are seen to be um, conflicts of, of, of interest. And as we'll now see, um, there was in fact a, a case from, from last year and from this year, went to the Court of Appeal this, um, this year when the judgment was given this year, involving Secretariat, um, where, where the, these conflicts issues um, came out. And we'll now look at the, the, the Secretariat case and, and see what the implications are of it. So, Secretariat, will probably be well known to, to many of you. In fact, I, I don't know whether there are some people who are watching from Secretariat. Um, it, it's, it's a very large um, US-based um, uh, consultancy. It's very respected. Uh, it's got some great experts, actually. Um, and I think it, it might actually be named after um, a, a racehorse, which is uh, called Secretariat. And you see a picture of it there. Um, the, the racehorse seems to be all over the Secretariat website. Um, perhaps someone can let me know whether that's that's the case or not. In any case, the Secretariat, like many of these expert houses, has um, experts who, who, who can give evidence in relation to delay, quantum, a, a, and many other important matters um, for construction arbitration. Now, the, the, the case itself uh, concerning Secretariat related to a project in Saudi Arabia, and, and in relation to this project, there was an arbitration that was brought uh, between the employer and the um, contractor. So, so the, the, the employer um, approached Secretariat in Singapore for a, a delay expert. And, and, and they said, do you have a delay expert? Secretariat Singapore said, yes, we do. And they were then asked to run a conflict check. So the, the Secretariat Singapore then ran a conflict check, which from what um, I can glean was, was a global conflict check. So it covered Secretariat globally. And then Secretariat Singapore uh, entered into an engagement letter that confirmed that there were no existing conflicts of interest for Secretariat in, in, in acting as delay expert uh, here for the employer. And furthermore, that Secretariat will maintain this position for the duration of, of the engagement. So Secretariat was saying, we have no conflicts and we won't have any conflicts um, while we continue to act as um, delay expert in relation to um, this arbitration. But that, that's where things started. And then um, the plot thickened a bit uh, because uh, there was a second arbitration that was brought. Uh, and this happened later on. So, so this was brought by the project manager against the employer. So the, the project manager was making a claim. It said it hadn't been paid its fees. Um, and, and the employer defended this claim. And the, the, one of the grounds on which the employer defended the claim was by saying, well, actually, the project manager isn't entitled to all of its fees because it caused delay to, to, to the project um, by issuing drawings late to, to, to the contractor. And, and of course, the, the, the contractor and the employer were engaged in an arbitration, so of course, arbitration won. Um, so so that, that there was some overlap between um, the, the issues in, in the two arbitrations, although there were um, separate arbitrations between um, separate parties. So anyway, in, in relation to this second arbitration um, brought by the project manager against the employer, um, what happened was that a secretary in London uh, was approached by the project manager. Uh, and this is a separate legal entity from, from the Singapore Secretariat. They had the same name, of course, but um, as a matter of how they traded that, there were separate um, entities. And anyway, so the, the project manager approached Secretariat in, in London and, uh, in, in, 
and engaged um, an expert, um, engaged secretary as an expert on delay in quantum matters. And anyway, when the employer found out about this, um, it, it protested. And what it did was it, it said to Secretariat, well, um, we have this engagement letter with you saying you won't have a conflict uh, with us uh, for the duration of, 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 the, of, of your engagement in relation to arbitration one. You now have a conflict by acting for the project manager in arbitration two. So you should stop acting for the project manager. Secretariats uh, took a different view of this. Um, they, they, they uh, among other things, they, they said, well, actually, we don't think there's any re relevant overlap. And, and, and furthermore, we think the, um, the conflict position only applies, or the conflict undertaking only applies to the Singapore Office of, of, of Secretary, not to, to, to the London one. In any case, um, uh, the, 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 those arguments were, were actually unsuccessful. And, and so what uh, the employer was able to do was to get an injunction from the English courts, first from the Technology and Construction Court, that's the court that hears construction cases, and then on appeal um, to the Court of Appeal. Uh, and this was to stop Secretariat from acting in arbitration too. And, and, and you can see the, the judges there, um, Mr Justice O'Farrell from the TCC was the, the, the first instance judge, and then on appeal to the Court of Appeal, um, Lord Justice Coulson, who you see on the right there, gave the leading uh, judgment of the court. A and the court was quite clear that an injunction should be ordered here to stop Secretariat fr from acting in relation to arbitration too. So wh why, why was this? Well, the, the, the court reasoned that um, the undertaking given by the Singapore Office of Secretariat was that there wouldn't be a conflict of interest. And, and this undertaking applied to the whole of the Secretariat group. Um, so, so what one can argue about whether the undertaking was given in such a broad way, but that, that's, that's how um, they, they came down on this particular issue. So they said that there was this undertaking given, and then they said, um, so an undertaking not to have a conflict of interest. And then they said there was a conflict of interest here because um, the, the issues on which Secretariat London was engaged by the project manager for arbitration two, actually overlapped with the issues um, in, or at least some of the issues in arbitration one. So there was a conflict. So the injunction was ordered. Uh, so that, that was what came out of um, the case. But the, the court also made clear, particularly in the Court of Appeal, they said, actually, this problem could have been avoided um, if Secretary at Singapore had been quite clear that when it was giving undertakings as to conflicts and checking as to conflicts, it was only doing so on behalf of Secretariat in Singapore and not Secretariat um, globally. Um, so so that, 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 that suggests that there, there could have been a situation where you had Secretariat uh, Singapore acting in arbitration one and Secretariat London acting in, in, in arbitration um, two. And there are also other questions I, I think that, that might, might um, come out of this case as well. And I've, I've posed what we call a counterfactual um, so if, if things were different, um, and, and the question is, would, would the outcome have been different if there was not a conflicts provision in the, sec in the Secretariat Singapore engagement letter? So if, if Secretariat Singapore gave no undertaking as to conflicts, would there be a basis for, for ordering Secretariat London not to participate in, in arbitration too? And I think if, if, if that issue came out, then the whole law related to conflicts concerning experts would need to be um, explored, but it wasn't in, in, in this particular um, case. So, so what, what then um, comes out of, of, of the Secretariat case? What, what can we conclude uh, in, in relation to Secretariat? Well, we, we should start by noting that the, the case is dealing with an express contractual provision regarding conflicts of interest, and so it's not looking at the general law about experts and conflicts. And, and so we therefore have, as I note in point two, this, this uh, issue, which, which comes from, certainly as a matter of English law, um, which comes from Toth and Jung, which is whether when we're looking at expert evidence, um, we should be saying, at least from an English law perspective, not only should experts be independent uh, in the way they give their evidence, but they need to avoid conflicts of interest in relation to their evidence. There's an open issue, I think, about, um, about this. And, and um, 
we, we also uh, need to, to, to therefore ask whether um, the, the issue of a conflict is, 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 going to, is going to filter into the, 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 the world of international arbitration more generally um, in relation to construction cases. So it's not enough for experts to be independent. They must avoid um, conflicts. And a fourth point um, that, that I've, I've got there um, comes back to the nature of a lot of expert witness businesses these days, really, which is that you have um, individual experts, testifying experts, working part of large expert witness houses. And, and so, so what, what if you have a situation where the, the individual expert himself or herself has, has no connection with a, with a party, has no, and in that sense, has no, no conflict, but the expert witness business itself does because of some connecting factor. Does that somehow create a conflict of interest for the individual expert? And so I think we've got to also focus on what the important issues are here, whether it, what matters is whether the testifying expert has the conflict or whether the, the expert witness business has the conflict or whether it's both as well. So there are a few issues coming out of, of, of this case, which will need to be um, examined, I think, in due course. So I, I've taken you on a, a very long, hopefully not too tedious journey through English law and the various twists and turns. What about um, in relation to, uh, to other countries? Well, we, we could do a, a very long survey of the position in individual countries, and that would take a while. Um, as a bit of a shortcut, what I've decided to do is just focus on Qatar for, for a moment in relation to um, uh, Qatar's arbitration laws. And, and, and so let's just look at the, the 2017 arbitration law, which I'm sure many of you will be uh, familiar with. What does it say about um, expert evidence? Well, it doesn't say very much at all. In fact, if we go to Article 24.6, uh, it's really just the first sentence I want to draw attention to. So it says, each party to the dispute may appoint one lawyer or more to represent them and may seek the assistance of experts or translators. And that's it. That's, that, that's what it says. Um, so that, that's essentially saying that if you are a party to an arbitration, you, you can appoint an expert witness. That's up to you. So it, it doesn't say anything about the requirements of expert evidence, how it is to be given, uh, whether experts are to be um, independent of, of the parties or, or, or not. Um, not. Nothing is mentioned there. And that, that's not a problem. Um, most arbitration laws don't say very much at all in relation to expert evidence um, in, in, in arbitration. Let, let, let's now look um, at the, uh, some of the arbitration rules you find in, in Qatar and, and the Qatar Chamber. Uh, the Qatar International Center for Conciliation and Arbitration, KIKA, um, has its own rules, of course. These, these rules um, implement uh, word for word, essentially, the um, UNSTER trial arbitration rules. And, and you, you can see here, I've, I've set out the relevant ones. And they're actually reasonably interesting. So, so if you look at 28.2 of the Kika rules, you see witnesses, including expert witnesses, who are presented by the parties to testify uh, to, the, to the arbitral tribunal on any issue of fact or expertise, may be any individual, notwithstanding that the individual is a party to the arbitration or in any way related to a party. Now that's quite interesting, I think, because that's actually saying that even if you do have some kind of a relation to a party, say if you have a conflict even, that doesn't stop you from, from that in itself doesn't stop you from, from, from giving um, your expert evidence. So that, that's a positive provision that, that essentially says um, that relationships in themselves don't necessarily, um, or don't of themselves rule out your, 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 your evidence. But that, that's not the end of it though, uh, because we then have 28.4, of the Kika rules, which says the arbitral tribunal shall determine the admissibility, relevance, materiality, and weight of the, of the submitted evidence. So, so read together, it seems like what, what is really being said here is, is in relation to expert evidence is that the fact that a party is, is related to or has an association with a, a party in, in the arbitration doesn't preclude the expert evidence from being admitted. Um, 
but the tribunal can, can, can weigh up the evidence. And so if there is a, say, a strong connection between the expert and the party, and, and, and it's clear the expert is being influenced by that relationship, then maybe the, the tribunal can place less weight on, or even no weight, depending on how bad the, the, the expert is uh, in terms of, of being overtly um, biased towards, towards the party. Um, so so we, we, we can I I interpret that, I think, in that way. But it, again, it's not really laying out clear, fixed rules for, for um, the, the position of expert witnesses in relation to conflicts. And, and so let's also look at some other rules. Um, uh, briefly, we're, we're now coming towards the end. You'll be pleased to know um, the the IBA rules on taking uh, on the taking of evidence in international commercial arbitration uh, say a little bit about expert evidence <coughs> in relation to the expert's report. And, and Article five point two a, you see, the report has to contain the name and address of the expert and a statement of his or her present and past relationship, if any, with any of the parties, the legal advisors, and the tribunal. Um, so, so th there's a requirement for an expert to give a statement about his, his or her relationship with the parties, the tribunal, etc. Et in, in the report. But what you, you also notice is there's no mention there of, of the existence of, of conflicts of interest. Uh, and the, the rules don't say also what is to happen if there is a, a present or, or, or past relationship with, with one of the parties. Does, does it mean the expert can't give evidence? Ev evidence? Does, does the tribunal rule out the expert's report. The, the, the IBA rules don't, don't say. And I now want to contrast that um, with another lot of IBA rules, which are actually um, quite useful and quite interesting in this context because they apply to arbitrators. So, so what, one of the big issues, um, of course, for arbitrators is, is facing potential conflicts of interest in deciding whether or not to accept an appointment in, in an arbitration. Uh, and this perennial issue has been very helpfully addressed by the IBA by providing these, these, these guidelines, um, the current version of which is from 2014. <coughs> and, and what these, these guidelines do is provide um, what is in simple terms a, a traffic light -like system for, for experts where red means you can't act as an arbitrator, orange means maybe you can, and green means yes, you can. So there's, there's no conflict. So the, the, the IBA rules, they're not perfect, but they're, they're, they're they're pretty good and, and they give very helpful um, advice to, to parties and, and to arbitrators about when conflicts exist or they don't exist. So, so may, maybe if, if someone, uh, uh, some industrious person can uh, do a similar thing for expert witnesses, that may help to solve some of the problems which are emerging in relation to, to experts. So, so jumping to the conclusions, um, uh, that we can we can reach. What 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 can we conclude after having been on this this long arduous journey into the world of expert witnesses and, and, and conflicts of interest? Well, I think we can conclude um, a few points. First of all, um, the the issue of conflicts of interest isn't clearly addressed under English English law, whether that's English court rules, case law, uh, or indeed arbitration statutes, and even in, internationally, as we've seen, there isn't much much clarity there. Second point we can conclude is um, that there may be, notwithstanding the absence of any um, requirement in arbitration statutes or arbitration rules, notwithstanding any requirement um, or the absence of any requirement about conflicts of interest, parties can agree um, wording in the, in, in the engagement letters for experts, which deals with conflicts of interest. And that was the case in Secretariat. And I think that that sort of wording about avoiding conflicts is increasingly found, that's the second point. Um, and, and, and the third point is really to do with how things might develop, certainly when an English law approach is taken um, to, to this question of independence for, for, for experts and expert evidence and, and, and where it seems to be heading, because it seems to be heading in the direction of, of um, certainly English law saying, well, not only must expert evidence be independent, um, so the expert calls as, as he or she sees it. Um, but in, in, in addition, um, the expert himself or her, herself must avoid conflicts of interest. So, so there mustn't be the, the, the personal relationships which undermine the independence of, of the, the expert's position. 
And so what this means, I think, is that for expert, uh, experts who are being engaged, you will need to check, or you will be required to check whether you have any, any conflicts of interest in, in giving evidence in a particular case. And my final point, um, which I'll conclude on, is in relation to the international arbitration um, paradigm, which of course is what we're talking about um, today. And, and the, the point that I made a few moments ago was that we don't have any clear guidance for expert witnesses on, on this, this important issue of conflicts of interest. We don't have a sort of traffic-like system um, that we have for conflicts in relation to, to arbitrators. So what I'm suggesting is um, maybe an industrious person could sit down and prepare uh, a set of guidelines for expert witnesses to help them deal with this conflicts um, issue. So um, I will conclude there and hand back to Saad. Uh, thank you so much, Julian. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, before we start uh, the q and I would like to ask everyone to just start the Q&A in the, in, the, in the section Q&A there. I just would like to highlight as well that there is an RICS, Royal Institute of Charter Surveyor uh, Conflict of Interest Guideline. Uh, I think this is made as well for the expert witnesses. Um, uh, it, 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 is, it was built, I think, on the IPA uh, rules as well. It's uh, more of a summarized uh, version of that one. So I think many professionals, spe specifically on, I would say, in the construction industry, not in general for expert witnesses, specifically for people who are members of the RICS, are using these guidelines because I think are we are obligated to do so if we are members of the RICS. Uh, and I think CIRB recently has also issued some guidelines, which is basically, again, refers to the IPA. Uh, all of them based on because this is, was the first one actually or the most popular publications uh, has done the big one. So um, uh, before we uh, uh, move to the um, to the floor, I would like to ask you uh, um, a few questions from my side. So do you think if there is a conflict, for example, if you have two experts from the same businesses like uh, on an opposite sides of the case, but where there is uh, no overlap between their evidences. For example, if you have an expert on structural engineering for one party and the quantum expert, for example, for the other party, and uh, both are working for the same expert business. So uh, uh, there is a conflict? Or do you consider this a conflict? I, I think, that, thank you for the question. I think that that's one of the many difficult issues that, that we're going to see arising over time that we will need to have answers to. And, and, and certainly, looking at it from an English law perspective, um, you, you can certainly make the argument for saying, well, actually, there is no conflict there. Why? Because you've got two different experts um, and, and they are giving evidence on, on different matters. So one might be advising on structural engineering uh, and the other might be advising on, on, on delay or, or something like that. And there may, may be absolutely no overlap um, between them. So you might say in that situation, uh, even though both experts work for the same big expert house, there isn't actually a conflict there. Um, but an another way of looking at it might be to say, well, actually, the, 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 the big expert house has been engaged by, by different parties in relation to, to um, the litigation or arbitration. So, so they're actually on, on opposite sides. So because of the, the position of the expert house, there is a conflict. So it, it, it's difficult, and I think this is one of the many issues we need to uh, explore and have clarity on, just, just so that parties can conduct arbitration in, in an efficient way. Yeah, good, thank you. So, so another question, if you are appointing, for example, an expert to, to act for you in an arbitration uh, case, uh, do you ask them about the conflict of interest? I, I do, I mean, look, not, 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 notwithstanding, I, I've, I've just spent um, a fair amount of time saying that, that there shouldn't be any issue about conflicts of interest under English law. Um, yeah. This is a mistake, and that the, the, the requirement should be one of independence. Uh, the, the, the way things are going as well is, is such that actually conflicts of interest um, are, are, are seen as an important thing. So, so it's something that one has to ask experts about, and, and therefore I think experts themselves need to be attuned the sorts of issues that can give rise um, to conflicts of interest. Yeah, 
So uh, the last question from my side, some of the companies, which is all like reputable companies are practicing both, for example, supporting their clients on a, on, on a claims, then they have like another division, for example, like for, for expert witnesses. Um, some of them are involved at both stage. Would you consider this conflict of interest or uh, how you deal with this? Well, I, I, I think, you know, uh, a lot depends on how things are set up within the particular company because if you've got the person who's working on the claim is then the, the, the testifying expert uh the, 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 there's a, a contradiction there in terms of the role because if the role with the claim is to put forward perhaps uh, a claim that is more than in some ways the the party is entitled to um yeah. then how do you square that with the same person going to, an, to an arbitration and giving evidence and say well, that, 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 that claim that we made was, was, was fully justified in my opinion. So, so I think that, that, that's a difficulty, but the difficulty is usually addressed by um, separating out the teams. So yeah. you might have one, one team dealing with um, a claim or claims uh, and they're quarantined uh, and they're liaising with the client about that. And then you have a separate group of people who, or, or maybe just one person even, who is dealing with the 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 evidence for for the arbitration, and so that person needs to be kept separate and, and neutral. Um, uh, but but there, there will still be, I think, even then, a problem of perception because someone can say, "Well, okay, even if you weren't working with the claims team, Mr. Expert, um, you, you're still part of this company, and this company has a vested interest in helping out a particular client." So so I think the, the, there are still potential issues there for for the expert yeah. yeah well okay very well thank you so much uh the first question i will answer it because it's talk about actually do we have records uh, this is recorded and it will be published on our youtube channel and also will be published on the cir international uh website as well uh a question from uh colin uh, shehan uh, if the duty of the expert is to the court would, is, would, would it not be preferable in all scenarios for only one expert to be engaged by the court or arbitrator directly, thereby uh, uh, streamlining the process or the argument? Yes, no, thank you. And that's a fair question and something that um, I, I was, was going to refer to if, if time permitted. It actually opens up a different sort of area of, of debate as well. So we're talking about the, the court appointed or arbitration tribunal appointed expert yeah and there is a neat logic and simplicity to saying all of these problems with experts uh, are solved if the tribunal or the court appoints an independent expert the parties don't need to appoint their own experts and that the court appointed expert can deal with everything no problems about independence um, or conflicts even um, i think that that argument has a certain appeal to it but the, the, the reality seems to be a lot of the time that even when a court or an arbitration tribunal appoints an expert, the parties themselves will still appoint their own experts so that they can get their own advice about what the, 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 the correct position is in relation to, 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 to the issues. So, so ultimately, I think it probably leads to a bit of a false economy um, in, in terms of the, the, the cost of, of, of an arbitration because you still have the parties appointing their own experts um, and the supplies and litigation too. And, and, and then you've got the, the court or the tribunal appointing an expert. So, so yes, I, I can see the attraction of, of that approach, but I'm not sure in practice it, it, it really works. Yeah, good. The, uh, Julian, does the, part, does the experts get conflicted from the appointed or instructed lawyers? For example, if you're being instructed by a specific firm in one case, would it be considered as a conflict if you been instructed by the opposite firm who working against you uh, or against your party uh, on this running arbitration in another case or another arbitration? Well, uh, look, look, look again, I think that that is one of the, the live issues here. Um, it, it's an issue that applies <laughs> yeah. in, in relation to arbitrators, but it, it, it is something on which we, we don't have a clear answer. There's no guidance even. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so um, yes, I mean, I, you know, you, you could say that there, there is such a, a, a conflict, um, yeah. but 
uh, unless we have any, any clear guidance specifying yes. why there is a conflict or, or, yeah. or whether there, there is or is not a conflict, then we're, we're feeling our way in the dark. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so a question from Abdul Wahid Dar. Uh, if there is no rules or and the guidance in Qatar's arbitration law, and more specifically, if there was nothing written in uh, an um, arbitration agreement with respect to expert witness, what standards guidance can parties in case of in a case in Qatar use IBA, CPR thirty-five, RICS, or others? Well, look, I, I think um, in, in the absence of any applicable uh, rules concerning expert evidence, what, what parties tend to do is to adopt an international standard. And, and so, for example, the IBA guidelines, which I referred to, uh, are commonly used, I'd say almost universally used in international arbitration. Now, they're, 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 they're usually used as guidance, they're not treated as being binding on, on, on a tribunal, um, and they don't have any particular legal status as such. Um, but what, what people do in the absence of anything else is to get, is to go to these materials because they're respect, produced by a respected body uh, and they provide very clear and sensible advice on what to do so I, i'd say for example the iba guidelines are a good thing to use yeah but uh, uh, as you said there's nothing specific on the cutter arbitration law about the expert witnesses i think it just speaks about i think the how to investigate how to cross examine the expert and in terms yeah. of uh, not having the oath or something like that. This is all I think. What that, that, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So, so as, as people know from the 2017 law, it, it doesn't yeah. say that much. It, yeah. it, it gives, it gives um, um, some guidance or, or it sets out what, what, um, uh, what, what can happen in relation to the way evidence is given. Experts don't need to be sworn under oath and, and so mm -hmm. forth. But it's not getting into questions yeah, of conflicts of interest. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, Santush is asking, Santush Kumar, uh, Kumar is asking, can we conclude that if in any conflict of interest is expressly declared by the expert, uh, then they can uh, proceed with their work in hearing process? Well, look, I, I think the, the, the question arises, what if you do declare your conflict? And I think, um, or, or your potential conflict, can, can you proceed? Uh, the answer is, is not always clear. Because if you do declare a conflict uh, as an expert, um, the, the the other side may well say, "Okay, well you're not independent, so you're 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 biased. You shouldn't be able to give evidence here." And so there's almost a question about for, for an expert about if I declare this conflict or this potential conflict, is this going to rule me out of working on this 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 job? Um, so I think that there is an issue there. The issue has to be. Um, discussed in the first instance always with, with the lawyers who are, who are going to instruct the expert. So the expert has to be upfront about it and say, okay, well, just so you know, I, I, I've, I've previously worked for this party or that party, which, which, which might give rise to, to, to a conflict. And then people can decide on what to do. The thing that causes the most problems is when all these issues come out later on. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I think as a matter of good practice, experts should disclose to their instructing lawyers um, early on, what, what these potential conflicts are, but yeah. even it, it, by disclosing these conflicts, it doesn't necessarily mean you will be able to to proceed with uh, acting as an expert in the arbitration. Yeah, I think to add to your point is it's it's, it's good for the expert himself to refuse the appointment because me working as an expert, for example, I know that he will be hammered in the cross examinations and he will be facing the bad time of this one. So it's not in his favor to accept the appointment from the beginning, not just to declare this one. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, Vino Joseph is asking about if there is any ready-made questionnaire to identify if presence of conflict of interest? Uh, well, I mean, that there isn't, so far as I'm aware, uh, in relation to expert witnesses. But uh, again, if, if someone were to come up with a, a set of guidance, like the IBA rules uh, for, for, for arbitrators, where you work out whether there's a conflict, if you did a similar thing for, for experts, then you could come up with a checklist to work out whether the expert has or, or does not have a, a, a conflict. Yeah. To add as well, we have like an RICS, like certain clauses to be inserted in the expert reports. As a mandatory, so we some sometimes we put that there's no conflict whatsoever. 
Uh, Ali Abu Yusuf is asking for larger consultancy firm. Would the use of Chinese uh, Chinese ethical walls be good uh, solution to uh, elevate elevate the um, the concerns associated with the conflict of interest? Yeah, yes. So, so, so um, the, 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 I think the, the expression Chinese walls is is, is maybe not. Um, always not, clear the, 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 the wording that sometimes you use these days is ethical screen so it's yeah. basically an information barrier that's set up within a business to, to stop people on one side of the business from communicating in relation to the matter with, yeah. with other people and look this is something that law firms do uh, and many other businesses do and i think that's that's often a very helpful way of showing that the two teams who are working on um the same matter perhaps are, are, are in fact kept separate from each other so there's the risk of, of, of the, the, the conflict um seeping over from one team to the other is 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 severely reduced so yes chinese walls are good yeah uh lydia is asking uh julian hi please could i ask your view on party appointed experts conflicts aside um can they ever be truly independent if they are being paid by the parties or the party? Well, I mean, uh, can they be truly independent? Um, maybe if, if you're a purist, you might say no, uh, because there might be some subliminal or, or subtle influence going on, on there. Uh, but what, what, I, what I would say is this, uh, the, the, the good experts, the ones whose evidence is received, um, well received by tribunals and the ones who are in demand, are those who present to a tribunal in an independent way. So, so when they're giving their evidence to the tribunal, the tribunal looks at them and understands he, he or she, the expert, is, is actually expressing their honest opinion. It's their professional opinion. It's not some kind of biased view. And, and tribunals can tell that. They're, they're very experienced people. So, so you may not get true independence in the, in the pure sense but you you get something that i think is 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 fairly close to it which is what tribunals are, are looking for yeah uh uh dr uh nadraje s nadraje is asking can an expert engaged during the project give expert evidence during the litigation or arbitration or should an independent expert be engaged for the dispute resolution stages yeah, look, answer, yeah. No, the, the, to answer that question that, that's a good question actually the the answer is um Ideally, you would have a, a separate expert um, from the person who is working on, on, on the project because the, 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 the thinking might be, or the argument might be, that the expert working on the project is not independent, he or she is, is biased. But as, as we've seen from uh, th those English law cases that I was looking at before, the fact that someone is an employee of, of, of a particular party doesn't stop them from giving expert evidence. And what, 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 when might this happen? When might an employee of, of a party give expert evidence? Um, it, it's usually fairly rarely, but I'll, I'll give you um, an example of when this might happen. It, it, it happens usually where the field of expertise is very, very narrow. And yeah. so the, the number of experts worldwide could be very, very small, perhaps you know, less than 10 people who are expert in this field. So, so you may not be able to find a, a, an independent expert witness in, in a particular field. And, and therefore, the, 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 so long as the, the person, the expert who works for the party comes across as being independent, then a, a court or tribunal might well accept their evidence and say, OK, well, Dr. So-and-so uh, is an expert in, in this particular field. Um, yes, he works for, for the claimant, but um, that's not a problem here. He, he gave independent evidence and we accept that evidence. That, that sort of thing is, is a possibility. But coming back to the more general position, so in relation to, for example, delay and quantum and so forth, there, there are, as, as we know, many, many delay and quantum experts out there. So, so ideally, um, what, what you should do is, is get someone who, who, a delay or quantum expert who wasn't working on the project to give evidence for you. Yeah. Um, if he was working as an employee, you mean, on, on, on the project or, or involved in the consultant or something else, not specifically as an independent expert. Oh, I see. Um, so, so if the person was working as a, as, a, as a consultant on the project, 
Um, yes, the person could give evidence, but maybe as a factual witness, because we, we should also understand that the requirements we're, we're talking about in relation to expert witnesses yeah. don't apply in the same way to factual witnesses. So factual witnesses don't have the same requirements. The, the, the main requirement is that they give honest evidence to the tribunal yeah. and, and that they don't lie. Um, that's, that's the main criteria. Um, so, so there could be some possibility for, for such a person to give yeah. factual evidence. Okay. So the last five minutes in the questions before we jump to Ahmed, um, uh, Rajiv says, uh, uh, same experts working for same clients for different cases will consider as a conflict of interest, for example, five cases with the same client. He talks about like uh, yes, continuous uh, relationship between. Look, I, I, I think that's, that's, um, that's, again, one of the many areas of, of potential interest and concern when we're talking about conflicts, because if you have an expert who's worked five, his last five cases have all been for, for the one client, um, the one contractor or subcontractor, or whoever it is, um, you, you might say, well, there's a close relationship there um, because he's actually earning his livelihood, his, his income is coming from, from this particular client. So, so this person is not independent. So I, I think there is, there is that possibility. Um, for, for that lack of independence to, to, to be there in such a case. Yeah, we'll be lucky to have a client who have five arbitrations in one year. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, RK saying on the biggest client firm, one of the biggest client firms um, in this part of the world appointed many popular law firms to execute important tasks based on the framework agreement. Later, none of the after mentioned law firms could involved in the case against that firm due to the conflict of interest how to avoid such situation can the legal firm insist for a specific clause to avoid the consequences yeah okay well we're now sort of going beyond uh, experts conflicts into lawyers conflicts but that, that's a, a a fair question a situation that actually crops up for law firms such as mine from time to time uh, look the, 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 these these situations can be avoided uh, and the way you avoid them is in the terms of um, your engagement as a lawyer, uh, where, where you can have, depending on the ethical rules which apply to the lawyers, um, but you, you can have provisions which allow you to, to act in, in other situations against this particular um, client. But it, it's a major issue for law firms actually, because um, some, some, some uh, clients will insist in, in the terms of engagement that if the lawyer is engaged, perhaps as part of a framework or something like that, the lawyer agrees not to act against the client or affiliates of the client wherever they are in the world uh, and so forth so it, it, it conflicts out many law firms um, but the solution for law firms is is to not 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 to agree to that and to to get something else in your your engagement letter yeah okay last question from uh, Saki Troy uh, in case of conflict of interest is not worded in the contract and the one course order on uh, an expert gave his services, but later on his evidences are rejected due to conflict of interest. Who will bear the cost of the expert expenses? Right. So, so in, in that situation, the, the, the court appoints the expert and merges the expert as a conflict of interest later on. Yeah. And everyone's time is wasted. Uh, it, I, I think that very much depends on, on the rules of court that you, 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 you're talking about. Um, yeah. And it may be the case that uh, unfortunately, the, the parties have to bear their own costs um, of, of that. I mean, may, maybe the court will, will pay for the expert himself or herself, the independent or the, the court appointed expert, but um, the, the, the parties will probably have to bear their own legal costs. Okay, very well. So uh, can I ask, thank you so much, uh, Julian. Can I ask Ahmed to join us uh, to say a few words? Um, uh, maybe uh, Ashley can take... Uh a uh, couple of more questions. I think we still have more time. For my okay, mind. sure. So a uh, question from Martin uh, Maloney. Uh, say, are experts truly really independent if they are instructed to answer specific questions uh, by the appointing lawyers? Experts on either side may be asked to address different questions, so may not actually be addressing the same matters. Yeah, look, I, I think that the, the problem that's being referred to there is not really one of independence. It, it, it's a problem of um, the lawyers not asking the right questions, if you can put it that way. Um, and, and so what, what 
arbitration tribunals commonly do to avoid th this situation where the experts are asked different questions is, is that they um, require the experts to meet and, and to prepare a joint statement. So, so joint statements are often uh, ways in which the, 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 the issues are crystallized between, between the experts so that you don't have, as it were, ships passing in the night. Yeah, good. So this question is from my side. Uh, can expert witness advise their clients? And for example, if so, uh, to what degree and when does it uh, uh, contravene the, the expert's duty to the tribunal as well? So, sorry, can, can the expert advise? Yeah, can, can the expert witness advise their clients? And if, if they can advise their clients uh, up to which degree and uh, and how this do, does actually um, um, contravenes the, the the expert duty to the tribunal? Well, look, I, I, to, to give an answer to, 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 to that question, there, there isn't conceptually necessarily a problem in an expert giving advice to, 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 to a client, yeah. so long as the expert also comes across as being an independent person. Now, a, a fairly common example of where this, this occurs is where you have works which are, say, defective. Um, so it could be stru structural works and a, a, a structural engineer is engaged um, to, to look at the problem and to come up with a solution. Yeah. And, and, and then, so, so the, the structural engineer might do that. The person might be independent. And then the structural engineer later on is called to give in, in, independent, let's call it that, expert evidence about the structural engineering problem. So, so the, 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 there could be this, this, this dual role happening where the, the engineer in that case, the expert is, is doing two things at once. It, it's possible, I, I think in practice, it's often tricky to do. So, so it, it's, it, it's usually best if this situation is avoided. But I, I don't see why conceptually it would be impossible for that to happen. I think it does happen too. Yeah. Last question from RK. I have worked in a firm for 15 years back. Now I'm an arbitrator. I don't have any relationship with that company. Can I declare that to the parties and take the case or can I uh, be an arbitrator or I can be the arbitrator? Yeah, look, I, I, I suggest actually reading the IBA guidelines on, on conflicts for arbitrators because they, they cover this. But if you cease to be engaged um, with this company some time ago, say you know, five years ago, then maybe it's not a problem um, for, 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 for you. But remember, in, in the world of arbitration, so much comes down to perception. And, and the question is, how, how might one of the parties perceive this, uh, particularly the party on, on, on the other side of the, of the company in question? If, if you, you, you are acting as the arbitrator yeah. and you, you're a former employee or, or, or director or whatever of, of the company, um, you, you may not perceive to be to be biased. So I think that it, it's possible to act as arbitrator, but it's, it's, it's a difficult line to, to tread. Yeah, I think one senior um, um, practitioner said to me once that if you if the if the question is exist, there is a conflict or not, and you cannot answer it, I think it's better to say. I'm, I'm away you walk away from the case and just find something else to work on it because it will be always a question of there's a conflict or not i i, I think that's right and, and look you know there, there, there's there's a great difficulty that many arbitrators face because often when, when they're, they're being nominated for appointment the the other side will, will quickly raise an objection say oh there's a conflict here and so arbitrators need to to be robust and firm and, and to, to be alive to the fact that People can can use tactics to try to get them ruled out as, as arbitrator. Yeah. On the on the other hand, though, um, arbitrators need to understand that um, the, the, the whole process needs to be seen to be fair to the party. So if 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 there is something that that emerges which looks as though it could give rise to an impression of the arbitrator not being even handed, then often it is best for the arbitrator yeah. just to decline the appointment because it, it will just store up problems for later on. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Julian. Uh, let's move to Ahmed. So uh, uh, please welcome Ahmed Lansari, the uh, CIR Qatar uh, president, and he will be delivering the closing speech. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Shad. Thank you, Julian, for uh, that great and interesting uh, ICA lecture. Uh, I just would like to uh, mention one incident that I've been through uh, a few years ago, there was a case put before the uh, local court, 
and I was appointed along with uh, other four experts to look into it. And it just happened that uh, I led the team. And uh, because of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the nature of the multiple disputes in that case, you know, so they needed to appoint the experts in the different fields. And we found ourselves fighting every time we met, uh, you know, to discuss the case, the uh, evidences and the informations we gathered among ourselves. And there were a couple of people much more older than me. They thought they knew more, uh, you know, about perhaps the field they were specialized in. So they kept arguing with me. So we had our own internal conflict rather than, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> declaring conflict of interest. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, being biased to any of the parties involved in that case, for instance. Uh, anyway, uh, maybe you can uh, give me a bit of thought on that, uh, Julian. In case of uh, a case of multiple uh, disputes, how will it be so easy and convenient to uh, appoint a common expert that can deal with? Uh, uh, multiple kind of uh, disputes. Has it ever happened? Uh, so uh, we have not sure I, I could hear quantum. more of that, uh, Ahmed. So if yeah. you, you have we multiple... Have quantum, uh, when you have quantum, for instance, but at the same time, you have cost. Is it common you can hire one expert to work out the quantum and work out the cost? Just, uh, just as an example. Uh, so to have just, just one expert appointed by the tribunal, you mean? Yeah, by the tribunal, or, yeah. Yes, no, I, I, I think you can certainly do that. Um, and look, I, often having a tribunal appointed expert, it can be a way of just uh, eliminating conflicts, so long as the expert himself or herself has, has no, no conflicts. If you just hand, hand things over to one person, then that, that person can, can work out what the position is as regards to cost and quantum and so forth. And then you have no, no further argument about it, hopefully. Um, so I, I, I hope that, that addresses your, your, your situation. Yeah, I mean, maybe this is a, a very easy example, but if somebody, an expert, decides the entitlement for compensation, for instance, but couldn't work out the compensation. So uh, you know, perhaps you need to appoint someone else to uh, you know, estimate the uh, compensation related to uh, the entitlement of such claim, for instance. Anyway, uh, it's, it's a big topic. Maybe uh, I'm to be honest, working on it, and perhaps we can talk about it in, in sometimes in the future. Uh, uh, well, it, 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 it was an honor to have you with us, uh, Julian. I think uh, uh, we've been chasing you for the past for the uh, eight months. I think that's when we agreed. Uh, to have this uh, uh, event and on this particular uh, date. Finally, we made it. Thank you very much uh, for that. And as I said last time, we uh, had a conversation over uh, Zoom. I think it was last week. We'll be honored and delighted to uh, welcome you and host you on our uh, members' annual general meeting, sometimes March uh, next year. I hope that you can make it uh, down here because uh, we really uh, got so much frustrated with the restrictions and the lockdowns. And I think things are not getting any better back home there in Europe. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm still sure what's happening now with the uh, number of reported cases escalating day by day. I hope uh, things get uh, better. And it just happened that uh, the UK was uh, put back on the red list here in, uh, in Papua. <laughs> uh, so I hope that's going to be lifted very soon. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. Uh, it has been a very pleasant evening having the one of us and all of you. I hope you ha have uh, enjoyed uh, uh, the lecture this evening and uh, you gained a lot from it. And we'll be happy to welcome you uh, in the near future. The next event will be on the 15th of December. Uh, going to be uh, uh, delivered by uh, a legal counselor working for uh, Kiel. Um, I think most of you know the engineering office here in, uh, in Papua. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the uh, uh, topic itself, but uh, it's going to be announced. The topic on the screen, Ahmed, uh, it's uh, oh, the contract okay. awareness, risk management, and dispute avoidance uh, by Paula Qatar from KO.
Yes, okay. 15th thank of you. December. Yeah, thank you. And of course, I'd be uh, happy to see all of you rejoining us on uh, this uh, uh, next event. Uh, I must uh, uh, admit that we've been very impressed by the talk and with the number of the participants tonight. We have 113 people. That's quite a record for us. Thank you, Jovian. <laughs> you know, and uh, we look always forward to uh, seeing you uh, in the near future. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you so much, Julian. And uh, please, everyone, uh, if you have any question, this is uh, Julian um, email. Uh, you can uh, contact him. Um, and to just before we leave, um, as I was mentioning uh, to Julian previously, that his uh, book, the, the the third edition of the Construction Law, uh, which is you, Julian, can show to us now, it's already released uh, with a new publisher. And it's available, I think, in Amazon and on the publisher and could be requested anytime. It's really valuable book. I would hope that uh, all practitioners in the construction industry, specifically working in disputes, to obtain the three volumes of this book. Uh, it's now more affordable. Thanks to Julian for, for this. And um, uh, really appreciate it. I appreciate your time um, in helping us today, Julian. Thank you so much, Ahmed. I would like to also uh, um, thank our colleagues on the background, Nurul Sabri, the event manager who organized all this, and Franco, who was uh, master, uh, mastering the whole event. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thanks.